<laughs> you know what time it is. <laughs> Woo! Get into it! Get into it! Yes! We're back, lovelies. We're back. <laughs> we are back with another reading of a series of unfortunate events by Liberty Snicket, book four, The Miserable Mill. Now, Last time we were here, Klaus, unfortunately, got tricked yet again by Foreman Flopotato. And now has to go get his glasses repaired over at Dr. Orwell's eye doctor uh, shop. So, Sunny and Violet are not too keen on letting him go by himself, so they decided to accompany him uh, while he goes there. So we're going to start that up in a little bit, but I just wanted to let everybody know... Um, you don't have to watch these videos when they go live. You're more than welcome to watch them in your downtime, nap time, max and relax, and chillaxing time, break time, study time, in between time, mean time, CP time. Any time that you want to hear a highly animated voice bring you wonderful stories of magic, adventure, science fiction, and many, many more in between. Hmm. I've had a pretty awesome day, to say the least. No, I don't own the music that's being played in the background, which is brought to you by Harps Aboard. She is amazing. Please check her out on YouTube. Harps Aboard. So it's H-A-R-P-S-I-B-O-R-E-D. Harps Aboard. So if you like harp music and covers of different songs and video games and soundtracks and movies and so on, please check her out. Show her some love. She's got some incredible stuff. And this music is really giving me the ambiance that I need for what is going to be a quite an ominous chapter. At least it was to me when I first read this book when I was young. <clears throat> you know, I've never realized... Oh, Brett Helquist. Okay. So, if anybody has ever noticed, the series of Unfortunate Events, their cover art has always intrigued me growing up. It gives me a very much a Tim Burton vibe. Um, I don't know if that's what the illustrator was going for, but it would be really interesting. I mean, if you didn't know, there is a movie of a series of unfortunate events starring Jim Carrey, but that book mainly goes over... I think it only... Yeah, it only goes over the first three books of the series in that movie. And there's the Netflix series of A Series of Unfortunate Events, and that is Neil Patrick Harris starring as Count Olaf. Um, I don't, I've never seen it, so I don't know the viability of whether or not it's accurate to the book or if it's entertaining. But I really think that in the future, if they ever wanted to touch that series again um, to make it into a movie or a TV series, Tim Burton, please, please adapt the series of Unfortunate Events. I think that would be really good. All right. Chapter 8. Dr. Georgina Orwell. The Baudelaire orphan stood outside the gates of the Lucky Smells lumber mill and looked at an ambulance rushing past them as it took Phil to the hospital. They looked at the chewed up gum letters of the lumber mill sign and they looked down at the cracked pavement of Poultryville Street. In short, they looked everywhere but at the eye-shaped building. We don't have to go, Violet said. We could run away. We could hide until the next train arrived and take it as far as possible. We know how to work in a lumber mill now so we could get jobs in some other town. But what if he found us, Klaus said, squinting at his sister. Who would protect us from Count Olaf if we were all by ourselves? We could protect ourselves, Violet replied. How could we protect ourselves, Klaus asked, when one of us is a baby and another one can barely see? We've protected ourselves before, Violet said. Just barely, Klaus replied. We just barely escape from Kyle Olaf each time. We can't run away and try to get along by ourselves without glasses. We have to go see Dr. Orwell and hope for the best. Sonny gave a little shriek of fear. Violet, of course, was too old to shriek except in emergency situations, but she was not too old to be frightened. We don't know what will happen to us inside there, she said, looking at the black door, the eyes pupil. Think, Klaus. Try to think. What happened to you when you went inside? I don't know, 
Klaus said miserably. I remember trying to tell Charles not to take me to the eye doctor, but he kept telling me that doctors were my friends and not to be frightened. Ha! Sonny shrieked, which meant, ha! Ha! And then what do you remember? Violet asked. Klaus closed his eyes and thought. I wish I could tell you, but it's like that part of my brain had been wiped clean. It's like I was asleep from the moment I walked into that building until right there at the lumber mill. But you weren't asleep, Violet said. You were walking around like a zombie, and you caused that accident and hurt poor Phil. I don't remember those things, Klaus said. It's as if I... And his voice trailed off, and he stared into space for a moment. Klaus? Violet asked warrantly. It's as if I were hypnotized. Klaus finished. He looked at Violet and then at Sonny, and his sisters could see that he was figuring something out. Of course, hypnosis would explain everything. I thought hypnosis was only in scary movies, Violet said. Oh no, Klaus answered. I read the Encyclopedia Hypnotica just last year. It described all these famous cases of hypnosis throughout history. There was an ancient Egyptian king who was hypnotized. All the hypnotists had to do was shout Ramsey, and the king would perform chicken imitations, even though he was in front of the royal court. That's very interesting, Violet said, but a Chinese merchant who lived during the Ling Dynasty was hypnotized. All the hypnotists had to shout was Mao, and the merchant would play the violin even though he had never seen one before. These are amazing stories, Violet said, but a man who lived in England in the 1920s was hypnotized. All the hypnotists had to do was shout Bloomsbury, and he suddenly became a brilliant writer even though he couldn't read. Mercy, Sonny shrieked, which probably meant, we don't have time to hear all these stories, Klaus. Klaus grinned. I'm sorry, he said, but it was a very interesting book, and I'm so pleased that it's coming in handy. Well, what did the book say about how to stop yourself from being hypnotized? Violet asked. Klaus's grin fade. Nothing, he said. Nothing, Violet repeated. An entire encyclopedia about hypnosis said nothing about it at all? If it did, I didn't read any of it. I thought the parts about the famous hypnosis cases were the most interesting. So I read those, but I skipped some of the boring parts. For the first time since they had walked out of the gates of the lumber mill, the Baudelaire orphans looked at the eye-shaped building, and the building looked back at them. To Klaus, of course, Dr. Orwell's office just looked like a big blur, but to his sisters it looked like trouble. The round door, painted black to resemble the pupil of the eye, looked like a deep and endless hole, and the children felt as if they were going to fall into it. I'm never skipping the boring parts of a book again, Klaus said and walked cautiously toward the building. You're not going inside? Violet said incredulously, a word which here means, in a tone of voice to indicate Klaus was being foolish. What else can we do? Klaus said quietly. He began to feel along the side of the building to find the door, and at this point in the story of the Baudelaire orphans, I would like to interrupt for a moment and answer a question. I'm sure you're asking yourself. It is an important question, one which many, many people have asked many, many times in many, many places all over the world. The Baudelaire orphans have asked it, of course. Mr. Poe has asked it. I have asked it. My beloved Beatrice, before her untimely death, asked it. Although she asked it too late, the question is, where is Count Olaf? If you have been following the story of these three orphans since the very beginning, then you know that Count Olaf is always lurking around these poor children, plotting and scheming to get his hands on the Baudelaire fortune. Within days of the orphans' arrival at a new place, Count Olaf and his nefarious assistants, the word nefarious here means Baudelaire-hating, are usually on the scene, sneaking around and committing dastardly deeds, and yet so far he has been nowhere to be found. So as the three youngsters reluctantly head toward Dr. Orwell's office, I know you must be asking yourself where in the world this despicable villain can be. The answer is very nearby. Violet and Sonny walk to the Aisha building to help their brother up the steps to the door, but before they could open it, the pupil swung open to reveal a person in a long white coat with a name tag reading Dr. Orwell. Dr. Orwell was a tall woman with blonde hair pulled back from her head and fashioned into a tight, tight bun. She had big black boots on her feet and was holding a long black cane with a shiny red jewel on the top. Well, hello, Klaus, Dr. Orwell said, nodding formally at the Baudelaire's. I don't expect to see you back here so soon. Don't tell me you broke your glasses again. Unfortunately, yes, Klaus said. 
That's too bad, Dr. Orwell said. But you're in luck. We have very few appointments today, so come on in and I'll do all the necessary tests. The Baudelaire orphans looked at one another nervously. This wasn't what they had expected at all. They expected Dr. Orwell to be a much more sinister figure. Count Olaf in disguise, for instance, or one of his terrifying associates. They expected that they would be snatched inside the eye-shaped building and perhaps never return. Instead, Dr. Orwell was a professional-looking woman who was politely inviting them inside. Come on, she said, showing the way with her black cane. Surely my receptionist made some cookies that you girls can eat in the waiting room while I make Klaus's glasses. It won't take nearly as long as it did yesterday. Will Klaus be hypnotized? Violet demanded. Hypnotized? Dr. Orwell repeated, smiling. Goodness, no! <laughs> Hypnosis is only in scary movies. The children, of course, knew this was not true, but they figured if Dr. Orwell thought it was true, then she probably wasn't a hypnotist. Cautiously, they stepped inside the eye-shaped building and followed Dr. Orwell down a hallway decorated with medical certificates. This way to the office, she said. Klaus, tell me he's a quite a reader. Do you two read as well? Oh, yes, Violet said. She was beginning to relax. We read whenever we can. Have you ever encountered, Dr. Orwell said, in your reading the expression, you catch more flies with honey than with vinegar? Tasma! Sonny replied, which meant something along the lines of, I don't believe so. I haven't read too many books about flies, Violet admitted. Well, the expression doesn't really have to do with flies, Dr. Orwell explained. It's just a fancy way of saying that you're more likely to get what you want by acting in a sweet way like honey rather than in a distasteful way like vinegar. That's interesting, Klaus said, wondering why Dr. Orwell was bringing it up. I suppose you're wondering why I'm bringing it up, Dr. Orwell said, pausing in front of the door marked waiting room. But I think all will be clear to you in just a moment. Now, Klaus, follow me to the office and you girls can wait in the waiting room through this door. The children hesitated. It will just be a few moments, Dr. Orwell said and patted Sonny on the head. Well, all right, Violet said. It gave her brother a wave as he followed the optometrist farther down the hallway. Violet and Sonny gave the door a push and went inside the waiting room and saw in an instant that Dr. Orwell was right. All was clear to them in a moment. The waiting room was a small one, and it looked like most waiting rooms. It had a sofa and a few chairs and a small table with old magazines stacked on it, and a receptionist sitting at a desk, just like waiting rooms that you and I have been in. But when Violet and Sonny looked at the receptionist, they saw something that I hope you have never seen in a waiting room. A name played on the desk read Shirley, but this was no Shirley. Even though the receptionist was wearing a pale brown dress and a sensible beige shoes, for above the pale lipstick on Shirley's face and below the blonde wig on Shirley's head was a pair of shiny, shiny eyes. That the two children recognized at once, Dr. Orwell in behaving politely had been the honey instead of the vinegar. The children, unfortunately, were the flies. And Count Olaf, sitting at the receptionist's desk with an evil smile, had caught them. love a good mystery. And that is where we will end for today. Now, as always, if you have any recommendations of books you would like to hear on the channel, if you have any suggestions on music, obviously they have to be copyright free because I'm not trying to get sued. So, if you have any suggestions or comments or concerns or any opinions, please comment below or message me. I'll see you all next time.